Welcome to the new season of the Live Your Spa Life Show. The Spa and Spa Life stands for Seek Power Always, that divine power within you to do what you're here to do. The theme for this season is Freedom Fighter. Amazing people like you share ways to ensure your freedom physically, financially, spiritually, and in your relationships to create a world-class life. In these times of uncertainty, it's time for you to move past the distractions and start trusting yourself more through your God-given knowingness. No one truly knows better what's best for you than you. In this season, you'll have plenty of examples of people choosing their best life and giving a voice of freedom to those who are also looking to have their best life. Thank you for sharing your precious time with us and being part of the Live Your Spa Life conversation. With us today is Mark Struczewski. He is also known as Mr. Productivity. He helps solopreneurs deal with the overwhelm that disrupts their productivity. Mark, welcome to the show. Diane, I am so glad to be here for you and your audience. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Well, productivity seems to be a little bit of this obscure thing that we're supposed to do, but people don't necessarily know how to get there. So how did you get into productivity? And more so, how did you get that moniker of Mr. Productivity? <laughs> well, it all started when I was fired from my corporate job back in July of 2005. I didn't want to be Mr. Productivity because I didn't know what productivity was a thing back then, but I was fired from my job and then I became an entrepreneur and now remember, we're talking 2005. Facebook was just a baby. Twitter wasn't around yet. And most people were using either email marketing or direct mail for to promote their businesses. But then I noticed that there are a group of people that would go around and they're called speakers. And I'm like, what, are, what, what is that? <laughs> so I happen to have a lady in my Bible study class who was a speaker. And I'm like, hey, could you tell me how to become a speaker. I don't know how to do it. And so she gave me the, the guidelines, told me what to do. And, and so I started promoting my photography business, uh, which failed by the way, uh, by speaking at groups. And I fell in love with speaking, which is ironic because when I was in high school and college, I hated standing in front of anybody talking about anything. And now as a parent with my podcast with over almost 1200 episodes, I can't, you can't keep it shut up anymore. <laughs> so one day I was on a phone call with a coach I had invested in and I was kind of uncharacteristically blue. I, I'm normally like Tigger from Winnie the Pooh. And he says, what's going on? I said, I really like teaching and speaking and training, but I don't know what I should, what my topic should be. And he, and he just says, well, why don't you talk about productivity? And I remember saying, I don't know where that came from, but why would you say that? And he goes, well, I know a lot of people and you are like naturally productive. You should share that gift with the world. And the rest, as they say, is history. Mm -hmm. Now, Got in terms it. of Mr. Productivity, there was a guy on LinkedIn named Jeff Young. He started giving me the hashtag Mr. Productivity. And I'm like, hey, can, can I use that? He goes, of course you can use that. <laughs> and I didn't just use the hashtag. I went out and got mrproductivity.com because if I tell people to go to markstruchowski.com, if you're not from Poland or you don't know me, <laughs> lots of luck. So it's just, I got the redirect for people's ears. Got it. So great. So how did you go from focusing on conquering productivity or conquering overwhelm and then becoming, instead of becoming more productive, like how do you make the distinction between overwhelm and productivity? Well, what's interesting is I, I still teach the same thing, but I realized one day, I, I guess I might've taken someone's course or a coach or something. Not one person has ever come to me and said, Mark, I want to be more productive. What they were <laughs> saying is I am so overwhelmed with my to-do list and my calendar and my commitment. And I'm like, so they liked the content, but they weren't resonating with the productivity angle. And so I started telling people, I help people deal with overwhelm. And now what they do, instead of getting this glazed look on their face, now they kind of lean in and go, oh, how do you do that? I'm like, wow, isn't that amazing? Same topic, same, everything's the same, except now I tell, I help people deal with overwhelm instead of productivity, because that's the word that they use. And as any entrepreneur or business person knows, you're supposed to use the words that your prospects say, not the words that you want to use. Right, right. Well, so now that we have the word, how do you help people uh, go get through that overwhelm? Well, it's amazing because I'm a big fan of, of simplicity. 
of common sense. So I have a guide on that will tell people how to get my my 10, 10 quick, quick tips on how to conquer overwhelm. But one of the first things to tell people is to stop. We have this tendency that when we are in the forest, in the quicksand, whatever analogy you want to use, we just want to keep on fighting and we have trouble going, you want me to stop? Yeah, because what happens is when you get in the overwhelm, your brain is flashing all these danger signals, these red lights, these warning lights, and it wants you to, hey, I, I need to I need to sort through all this stuff. And if you keep on going, the overwhelm gets worse and worse and worse. And so the first thing I tell people to do, whether they're client, they listen to my podcast on social media, hear me from the stage is stop. I mean, literally stop what you're doing. And we live in a world that like, if you stop, then you're being lazy, but stopping is the number one thing you should do when you're overwhelmed. Got it. So important. Well, and I'm sure that that's kind of like a, like with people's brain, right? Because they always already feel behind, you know, people have this unrealistic expectation in a day of doing like 50 things on a to-do list and berate themselves for doing it, but always feeling like they're behind. So how do you help people kind of shift gears on that to, to actually get to that place of stopping and what do you, how do you lead them from there so that they realize that not everything's going to fall off the rails by doing that? Well, it's interesting. You can't go to my website and book me as a coach. We have to have a discovery call because I need to know what are you dealing with? Because I know you're going to find it's hard to believe and your audience is going to find it's hard to believe. We're all different and everyone's going to have different degrees of overwhelm, different triggers of overwhelm. And so I really need to figure out what, what is causing your overwhelm. See, I can't quote, fix the problem unless I get a full picture. I have never had two clients that have the same issue before. And what's amazing is when I ask people what triggers your overwhelm, they go, I don't know. And so we have to have this conversation and I have to dig and dig and dig to find out because most people, because they're so busy, they don't realize what's causing their overwhelm because they've got all these, I call them fiery arrows coming from all directions, you know, some on their phone, some from their computer, and you got Zoom and you got your workers and your neighbors and the dogs barking, and, and but you can't put a word on it. So the first thing I do with people is we figure out what is causing their overwhelm. What are the triggers? Because once, I, like, I used to be a volunteer firefighter, okay? We can't put the fire out until we know what the address of the fire is. And then when we get the address of the fire, we get in the fire truck, we drive to your house, we put our gear on, take the hose in the house, put the fire out. But if you just say my house on fire, um, okay, where are you? I, I don't know. So it is a it involves a discovery process. Got it. Well, I like that distinction because it's so important that a lot of times we think of overwhelm as being just this one thing. But when you throw in the people, there is such a different thing. I mean, as a retired police officer, I would always get calls 911. It's like, you know, the big emergency. And what one person sees as an emergency or overwhelm or can't deal with their life for somebody else, that is like a hangnail, like it's not that big a deal. So based on our life experiences, you know, something that some people may think is, is a small, no big deal thing can actually shatter someone in their experience because of how they relate to it and what they do. And then other people who really have a lot going on, who are used to that may not even register that as they're moving through. So I love that idea of distinguishing based on that person's experience, how it's actually affecting them, what they can do when you're having that discovery and you're really, you're talking to people about that. Um, how much does that self-awareness come in with them actually knowing what's triggering them? It's huge because most people I don't think are self-aware. Mm -hmm. They are living what I call a reactive life. They're just responding to whatever they need to respond to in that minute or that hour. And so when you say, are you self-aware? Most people don't even know what that word means unless you're in the personal development space or the self-development space. People go, I, I don't know what that means. And so I've got to educate on people on like what that means. So in the very beginning of the process, it's always an education because most people have never talked this kind of word before, but you have to understand. And if the audience is not understanding self-aware just means, okay, where are you right now? 
What are you going through? What are your triggers? Are you aware of what's going on inside and outside? And most people, because they're operating in a reactivity mode, they're just like going and they're not even paying attention. They have a flat tire, the, the check engine lights on, and they're just going. And then eventually they have, a, unfortunately, a catastrophic breakdown, maybe they have a breakdown or they start going to illegal substances to cope because they never dealt with the problem. When that warning light first came on, they didn't deal with it. Whether that's investing in a coach or a course or going to a conference or a therapist, they didn't heed the early warning signals and they waited too long. Now they're not beyond hope, but the problem is now it's going to take longer because you waited too long. It's kind of like if you don't check the, take your car in when the check engine light is on and you wait until there's smoke coming from your engine. Well, now you may have gone from a simple repair to a major repair. Right. Right. Got it. Now that that's really helpful because I think when people are in it, they don't even really understand the the steps that got them there and what it takes to unravel that and what it looks like. And so mm -hmm. for some people, there's, you know, if there's fears that come out either because they don't know what to do or they are afraid to ask. I mean, there's a lot of different things in that. One of the things that you've talked about before in terms of dealing with fear is to get clear on what your why is. Um, for you, how much do, do you refer back to your why? How much do you help people discover what that is for them? Uh, I think sometimes people start with an initial why and sometimes it can change or they kind of lose focus on that, which I think gets them back into that, that circle and loop of, of the overwhelm. So how is it that you utilize knowing your own personal why and how do you help Help your clients um, keep that in their forefront. Well, I'll tell you a little story in the beginning. I used to tell people how to plan, and I was trying to come up with all these, you know, whether training material or podcast episodes, whatever the case may be. And one thing I, it just hit me. I'm like, wait a minute, how do you know what to put on your schedule? What to put on your plan? What to put on your calendar? I'm like, hmm. Oh, I know. You have to tie your goals to your plan. And then I said, wait a minute. Where do goals come from? Goals come from your why. So now I got this three-step process, why, goals, and then plan. Because if you don't have goals, what do you put on your schedule? Well, right. what do your goals come from? The why. Why are you here? And I, I just turned 57 on June 21st of 2022. And I didn't know what my why was until about a year and a half ago. I was just thinking I was going to help people be more productive. And that was my why. Now I understand my why is to help 100 million solopreneurs bust through overwhelm, which is a, a goal I'll never know if I accomplish because someone could listen to this or watch this and they could bust through overwhelm and I'll never know about it. But you got to start with the why. So if you don't know your why, it's okay. Take a deep breath. There's no why police out there. No one's going to come to your house and say, you have a why. Okay. And your why could change. I mean, I'm 57. Maybe you get one why when you're 27, another when you're 37, another one at 47. And I wouldn't worry about what your why is. Okay. When you discover it, you will know. I thought I knew my why before I came up with this why. I really didn't. So I think people need to spend time thinking about their why, but not obsessing over what their why is. Mm -hmm. Good distinction. So do you think people have more than one why or are there kind of like little things that, you know, move into one big why? That's an excellent question. I would say that you can have more than one why, but I think you should have one major why. So I'm a big fan of Jim Collins. He created the BHAG, the B, Big Harry Audacious Goal. I think you should have one Big Harry Audacious Goal. Now, my BHAG is my, my why to help 100 million solopreneurs conquer overwhelm. But I guess you could have smaller whys, but I think you need to have one true North Star, your big why. Mm -hmm. Yes. So good. Yeah, that's helpful. You know, uh, as I'm thinking of like, this is all intentional, right? We're creating the life we want to have, you know, there's the processes in that. And I think that our environment actually impact a lot of that. And so we think of, we act, we are different in our bedroom versus our kitchen or our office. So what's your favorite room in your home and why? Hmm. That's very interesting. Cause I can make a case for every room in my house, uh -huh. except for the garage. I'm not mechanically inclined. So if the car breaks, we take it to the, the car guy. 
I well, see, I like my bedroom because before I go to bed, I like to sit in the chair next to my nightstand and read. So that's a very nice uh, place. Of course, you have the living room. My wife and I like watching TV and hanging out together. And of course, I'm a guy. I love food. So I guess the kitchen would be a good uh, a, a good room for me. And then there's this, this spare bedroom in my home. This is my podcast studio. So I guess I really couldn't pick one room. I, I like every room in my house. Okay. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that there's like, there's some intentionality that goes in that. And when you are intentional about your life, you know, how you use your spaces, what's considered maybe a, a sanctuary for you versus, in, you know, connecting. And this is where people start discovering part of their whys is how are they spending their life in the spaces that they already have? Like, what have they created in that? So I always find that there's some insights in that, uh, what people have created in their life, how they spend their time, and then what's important to them. So that's kind of where, where that comes from. Interesting. What, what is your uh, favorite room? Mine's my bedroom, okay. you know, cause that's the one where I can just turn everything off. I, I get to have that restoration. I also have like a, you know, a, a sofa in there from my grandmother. There's, there's like things that are, are, you know, special to me that are in there. So I just feel like it's, it's that place where I get to just like unplug. So it's my nice. favorite. Nice. Yeah, definitely. And of course, I have a sunken bathtub in there, too. So, you know, that's also part of that, <laughs> you know, uh, indulgence, if you will, that, that comes with the, the fun things in life. So definitely. Nice. hopefully it's not right, like right next to your bed, because that would be not right next. Because uh, that'd be interesting <laughs> to roll out of bed in the bathtub. <laughs> not that far, though. So it's okay. pretty good. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of that intentional living, um, you know, you talk a lot about uh, morning routines and the importance of those. What is your morning routine and what do you think is one of the most important things to include in a morning routine? Well, I live in Houston, Texas, so my morning routine does change by the season. Right now, it's August. And so during the warm summer months, I like to wake up. I typically get up between 530 and six o'clock. The first thing I do, and I don't recommend everyone do this, I post a, a pre-recorded Instagram reel on Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, and Facebook, and YouTube first thing. So I roll out of bed. First thing I do is post that video. That's the first thing I do. Now, I'm not looking at social media. I'm not scrolling. I'm not checking messages. I'm not doing any of this stuff. All I'm doing is is I'm posting that for the day. Then I will read, uh, I read a chapter of the Bible every morning and every night. Then I write my goals out for that day. And then because it's summertime, then I go out for my morning run. I've been running every day, at least one mile since August 29th, 2017. It blows my mind at the end of August of 2022, I will hit five years I, it's insane that I've been running at least one mile every day for almost nearly five years. And, and so when I come home after that, then I, I have breakfast, which is an all organic shake, take a shower, and then I'm ready for the day. Got it. Got it. So tell me what is the intention behind doing something social right when you roll out of bed? Well, because I am trying to build my business and my brand. I want the world to know about me and I want to get that hit first thing in the morning. And hopefully by mid afternoon, I get a lot of views and a lot of comments on it, but I, I know a lot of people are addicted to their phones. And the first thing they do is they check that phone. They want them to see my content, which is always about, it's always a less than 60 second video to help people in some aspect of being productive, being positive, having a better life. That's what I do that first thing in the morning. Uh, and do you do that based on intuition, you know, in, inspiration from maybe reading something out of the Bible? Is there, you know, is there specific things like, do you know when you wake up what you're going to do? Or are you led by what happens when you wake up in the morning? The video is already pre-recorded. So what I do is on my target list every day is to record or create one or two short videos. And then I go into a, a, a software I use online and I actually put the captions because Someone once told me that 85% of videos are watched without sound. And so yep. I've got enormous captions on all my videos. So you can actually read instead of having the volume up. And I do that because I have a whole bunch of content. So I may create two, one day I'll create three, four videos. And then I have them all captioned. I do schedule them on YouTube and Facebook. They allow me to do that. Uh, TikTok and Snapchat, you really can't do that. And so that's how I do that. So these are not done when I wake up, these are already pre-recorded. So I just open up my Dropbox 
uh, app. I download the video from the day, the same video posts on all the platforms, and I just add it. And then once I add it to Instagram Reels, I copy the uh, the, the the description, and I copy that in my clipboard, and I put that in all those social media sites. So the whole thing only takes maybe six minutes. Okay. Uh -huh. Remember, I'm not scrolling social media this time. I'm post, 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 post. Then I go read my Bible. But the, what's in terms of the content, sometimes I'll be out walking my dog and I always bring my phone. I'll get an idea and I'll record a video. And then I may be, uh, my wife may run in the store. I'll be in the car, create another video. But I just pile these up. I I'm usually like three to four weeks out ahead of time because not it's evergreen. So I'm not talking about a specific thing. I'm just trying to have content out there because right now people have a really short tension span and shorts are so powerful they are the number one content people are consuming because you look at reels are less than a minute tiktoks less than a minute and actually shorter is better so yeah. if you can say it in 20 seconds i guess do it in 20 seconds because that's what the world wants yeah absolutely these little snapshots of things and that yep what these things that capture people's attention and all of that. So um, I'd love to hear like what has evolved uh, for you in having the habit of reading the Bible, you're doing it twice a day. Um, what have you noticed has shifted for you in, in having that habit? Well, according to my wife, I have become a more calmer person. I don't know how calm I could possibly be. I'm really, I'm really hyper, uh, but I, I don't know everything about life. and. I'm on a discovery. Like I said, I'm 57. I have at least 43 more years left on this planet. And I want to become a better person every day. And I can't think of a better uh, way to do that than reading the Bible. Now, if you're a Muslim, you should be reading your Quran every day. If you are a Jew, you should be reading the Torah every day. Whatever your spiritual text is, you should be reading it every day or something inspirational. If you're not a religious person or a spiritual person, maybe you read something like Think and Grow Rich or something like that. You should read that every day from somebody who's very successful. And because I want to, the reason why my morning routine is so important, I want to start my day on my, 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 uh, what's the word I'm looking for? On uh, my my own, I lost the word on uh, my own setting. I guess I that's a bad word, but I want to mm -hmm. set it my way. I don't want to start the day if you get into social media or your email or text messages or goodness gracious a news app. Well, now you just woke up from hopefully a really good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. Now you read about this negativity or that negativity. Now your day shot already and you just woke up. So mm -hmm. I very intentionally start the day the way I want to start the day. And I want to start the day positive because I know everything that's going to happen to me that day is not going to be positive. So I want to start my day positive and then maybe get as far into the day without negativity as I possibly can. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they call it programming for a reason, right? You don't want to be programmed by other people's, mm -hmm. you know, their agendas and things. So setting your own value system, your own foundation for that positivity and feeding your own mind with the things that matter to you. That's why yep. knowing what your values are, you know, really help you to build that foundation and to choose some of those things. So uh, what is what is your favorite verse these days that, that you're called to? Oh, my goodness. Oh, there is. Well. Everyone says John 3.16. I don't say John 3.16 because everyone says that. <laughs> my favorite verse. Oh, my goodness. You've really stumped me here because there are so many, uh, you know, there's so many verses. Now, I really don't have one. My favorite Psalm is Psalm 139. Mm -hmm. You know, God always knew us and he knit us together in my, mo in my mother's womb. But that's not really a verse. Mm -hmm. You really you really hit me off the left field there. I have so many verses right now. I don't have them memorized. That's. That's one of the things I need to work better on. I don't have a lot of the scripture memorized right. and it's something I need to spend more time doing. Yes. I don't always have all of them either. I think a lot of it is like a certain concept. I like to uh, do um, Bible roulette, right? Where I just open it up and go, this is the one that God wanted me to see. <laughs> and so, you know, that's kind of a fun thing. And like uh, Romans uh, 12, I like about, uh, you know, the renewing of the mind, right? Yes. You know, we always have this opportunity to renew the mind. And I think the one is um, my my personal challenge is, uh, you know, in around uh, be still and know that I'm God yes. to be still is something I consciously have to do because I am somebody who likes to fill the spaces and be connective and, and you know, jump into the day and do those things. So to me, sometimes having that stillness can feel like it's not productive time. Although I believe it's one of the most productive times. So how, when you share with people uh, around 
what is productivity, right? Because sometimes we look at it as, you know, doing the social media, you know, clicking off the dots, but then there are larger things in your life, things that, you know, you talk about like faith and family and the things that are integral into us living a life. And these words like productivity and success can be very elusive. So how, how do you distinguish that for people? I think a lot of people confuse the word productivity as only being for work. Mm. So when people come to me and they're like, productivity home? I said, yeah, productivity home. I said, I was raised an only child. And I, I think that's where I got into productivity. I think it was God's ordained plan my entire life because I was raised. I used to come home from school at 3.30. My mom and dad came home like 5, 5.30. And before they came home, I had certain things that had to be done. Homework had to be done. Uh, the dishwasher had to be emptied. And before the dishwasher was around, I had to wash the dishes, had to set the table, take care of the dog. There are certain things I had to do. So I think that's the way I was raised. And I tell people I wasn't working. I was at home and I was productive. You could be productive in your relationship. You can be productive in your church. You can be productive in your quiet time. So productivity is not just for working. All productivity to me means is you're making the most out of the time of what are you, whatever you're doing. You may be productive watching TV with your wife or your husband or your significant other if that's building your relationship. Mm -hmm. You're pro you may be productive. Like I like to go out in my backyard with my dog and she lays at my feet and I'm reading a book that could be productive. So I, I think we have to get rid of the idea that productivity is just for work. Productivity is for life. Yes. Oh no. I, I love the distinction of that. And I think that anytime you can kind of catch yourself where you actually feel this sense of, of peace and freedom and you're like living the life that you wanted to have to cement that, like to either capture that, you know, whether you're writing a journal or I like to keep notes on my phone, you know, because when you kind of catch yourself living and feeling inspired and, and really enjoying yourself, when you know what those things are, then you want to include more of that into your life. And because yeah, that's you being you and you, you living your life. And, and that is part of your, your contribution, right. Of, of what we're doing here in the world. And so I think this is such a, uh, I, I love your mission. I love what you're up to. I love making the distinctions between, you know, that productivity encompasses all of your life, that it's not just work. In fact, that would be a one-sided life. If you were just focusing on that, you have to look at the totality, which is why you have to have, you know, the conversations with people to see what are they about? You know, what are their stumbling blocks? Where are they at in relation to getting to that? And I know that our listeners are, are going to want to stay in contact with you. Um, how Mark can they do that best? The best way for them to do is go to overwhelmsucks.com, <laughs> overwhelmsucks.com. That is just a redirect to my website. I want to give you my 10 quick, that's the key word, 10 quick ways to conquer overwhelm. So you just go to overwhelmsucks.com. You name an email address, then I'll send you an email. You'll be on my email list. Once you're on my email list, you can find me wherever else I am in the world. I am on all the social media platform, but I have a pop quiz for you, Diane. Do you know what my favorite social media platform is? Hmm. That is, that is I bet, I bet you won't get it. I, bet I you don't think I will. I, I want to say TikTok and I don't know why. It's similar to TikTok, but it's Snapchat. Snapchat. I, okay. I love Snapchat. I just found out this morning. I have a lot of followers on Snapchat. I had no idea how many followers I had Snapchat. I just love Snapchat because you can only do two things on there: videos and pictures. There's no timeline. It's it's to me, it's just fun. And most it just and it go, disappears, right? It's like you do it and it's gone. Yeah. Well, in 24 hours, that's where the Instagram came from. That's where TikTok. Well, TikTok doesn't disappear. But what's interesting is now they have public profiles so someone could follow me and I could put videos on my public profile that don't disappear, which is kind of fun. But what Snapchat's really known for is the, the, the they're called lenses or filters, which they're hysterical. They can change your voices or puppy dog ears. I mean, what you see on Instagram stories is like one tenth of 1% of what you can do on Snapchat. So I love Snapchat. When I tell people I'm on Snapchat, they're like, you're you're 57. I, said, I love Snapchat. 
<laughs> and it's it's just so fun. So I usually post things first, like story wise. It goes on Insta, goes on Snapchat first, and sometimes I'll put it on Instagram. My problem with Instagram, it's oversaturated. I mean, mm -hmm. I think, in my own personal opinion, they ruined it. Remember when Facebook or when Instagram was just photos? Yeah, I think they ruined it with the stories and the live and the reels. That they should have just been just photos. That's what people remember about it. And I guess there's a uh, there's a call out there. I saw on Twitter a couple of days ago. People like we want the old Instagram back where it was just photos. Uh, mm -hmm. Now it's too complicated. I think that's what people like about Snapchat is really complicated. It's really simple. It's really complicated to get started, but I've got some people who are now addicted to Snapchat. Sorry. Uh, but if you want to follow me on <laughs> Snapchat, you just go look up Mark Stuchowski. I've got, I, like I said, I've just found out literally this morning, how many followers I have on there. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I was thinking maybe five or 10, I'm like, whoa, there's that many. So I'm pretty excited about it. Now I'm even more in love with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think that you need to do like a, a video, a live or something about the productivity of Snapchat. Oh, there you go. The productivity of Snapchat. Well, the problem is Snapchat, like any other social media platform, can be highly addicting. I mean, I tell people, right. if you want to be productive, stay off of TikTok. So what I do in my morning video, I post it because there's a way you can get right in there and post a video on, on, Inst on uh, TikTok. If you want to know how. Yeah, when you now it depends on what kind of phone you have. I have an iPhone, so I can press and hold the TikTok logo, and it says "Start Recording." So I tap that, and it brings me to the to the upload screen. I upload the current video, and then once I add my description, the hashtag, and I hit publish, the of course TikTok's trying to be helpful. They're trying to show you a video, right? First thing you do is tap the middle of your screen. It pauses their video until your video finishes uploading. Then it leaves the platform. So mm -hmm. I check my notifications. Got it. So you're intentional. Yeah. And I know people say, oh, I'm not addicted by TikTok. And I say, well, let me see your screen time. And it's like <laughs> seven, eight hours every day on TikTok oh because you just scroll endlessly. Yeah. That, it's designed that way. So I'm like, it doesn't matter what the platform is. They are not your friend. They want to take away your time. So if you yeah. are disciplined enough, and I know some adults who are not disciplined, they're on their phones all the time. Yeah. I set alarms. Well, yeah, but I know there are people are, they try to justify, well, I'm not, I'm only like, I'm just passively. No, you are literally scrolling through video after video. <laughs> you just want to be careful about that because yeah. a lot of people don't understand. They're looking at cute dogs or cute babies or koalas. I'm like, is that a needle moving activity towards your goals? Does yeah. that feed your why? Endlessly scrolling on TikTok. And most people, they just get kind of like, oh, well, not really. Yeah. So just be careful. Right. I'm not saying don't be on social media. I'm saying be very careful. Social media, no social media platform is your friend. That Why do you think it's for free? There's a reason why it's for free, because they want you to see the ads and all the influencers. So just be careful. Yeah. Good advice, Mark. So good. Well, I'd like to end with, as you know, our theme for this season is freedom. So how are you choosing freedom in your life today? I love the way you fro uh, phrased it, choosing freedom, because a lot of people are not choosing freedom. They're in bondage to what's going on in the world. So I think part of the answer is in your question. You need to choose freedom. And you also need to choose who you're hanging around, what you're consuming, whether it's on social media, books, TV, people, whatever. You need to choose. I'm choosing to live a life of Tigger from Winnie the Pooh. I'm choosing to live a life of positivity. I know when I'm positive, I serve people better, but it's got to be a choice. I wake up every day excited for the day. I woke up excited for this interview once I found out there was an interview. Well, if you want, we could talk about that in just a second. But I wake up every day like I did when I was a little boy at Christmas time. Couldn't wait to see what Santa brought me. So my freedom is a choice who I'm hanging around with. It really matters. You can't live life reactively. you got to live it proactively. I love it. And I love that you're Tigger. So you're bouncy, flouncy, and lots of fun. Oh, I am annoyingly optimistic every day, <laughs> almost every day. The only time I, I get a little stressed is when I fly. I'm not afraid of flying. Even when I fly first class, which I do a lot now, I, when I'm on my butts in the seat, I'm happy. Okay. I just don't like the boarding process because it's not like missing your bus or something like that, or Uber, you can call another one. You missed your plane. You're out of luck. And I thought it would go away when I flew first class, 
but I was sad to find out that when you fly first class, you're no longer the first one on the plane anymore. Now they do people with little kids. They do, you know, <laughs> disabled people. They do veterans, the one K club. And I'm like, wait a minute. I paid a lot. Why, why do I get to board last? But uh, yeah. it is what it is. I'm not saying there's anything bad about those groups. I'm just saying for me, when right. I'm on the plane, I have no problem with flying, but I just, I don't, I'm afraid I'm going to miss the plane. I don't know. It's, it's really weird. So I get to the plane, I get to the airport like eight days before my plane takes off. I just, cause <laughs> you, you can't, you can't not really that long, but you know, you, 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 you miss a plane, you're out of luck, you know, and then it's another couple grand to fly again. So I just, that's one thing that really concerns me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so with that, I mean, talk about, you know, flying allows us freedom, right? So we got to yes. kind of go through the process to, to make that happen. And I think that we're seeing now that, that, People are choosing more freedom and they're getting clear about what they want to have in their life and that productivity is one of those routes there. So I just want to thank you, Mark, for sharing your, your wisdom, Mr. Productivity, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. All right. Until our listeners, thank you for being here with us. If you have any questions of either Mark or myself, please make sure you tag us on whatever your platform is, and we'd be happy to answer any of your questions. And until we connect again, live your spa life. Bye for now. Bye-bye. 